Hi there, everyone. Um, I want to tell you about this excellent book that I've read by S.D. Tucker. It's called The Saucer and the Swastika, The Dark Myth of Nazi UFOs. This book is dealing with how fascism, uh, neo-Nazism and neo-fascism exploit the flying saucer mythos and belief in extraterrestrials to kind of lure people into fascist ideology. And it goes into the ways that it does that, okay? And there's many ways, but um, it's very fascinating to read. I really recommend this book. It's about 300 pages of text, so it's not easy going, but I guarantee that you'll find it very interesting. Now, let me just um, give you a little bit of a flavor for what the book is about by giving you some of the titles for the um, chapters. Uh, there's a chapter called Tyrannosaurus Sex, Ariosophy, The Rape of the White Race by Apes and Dinosaurs and Other Myths of Nazi Occultism. So yes, you heard all that correctly because it's talking about Ariosophy, which was this Volkish ideology from uh, the earlier 20th century in the lead up to the Nazis. Uh, during a time in Germany, which was very strange in some ways because Germans were st still trying to identify who they were as a people and the, there were lots of ideas about blood and soil and uh, getting back to nature and the forest, some neo-pagan ideas as well and many of these ideas would find their way into Nazism. Ariosophy was an extreme racist religion and it basically talked about how the Aryan race was descended from angels who were powered by electricity. There was a fixation on Wotan and his uh, hammer, uh, it famously produces lightning, but in their view, the, the Aryan race angels were powered by electricity. Kind of a forerunner of free energy ideas, maybe. There are some fascist uh, currents within free energy thought. Um, I, I might talk about that later on. But the idea here was that the uh, angels became corrupted and lured by temptations of sex and lust and they started to rape um, animals and stuff like that. Really stupid, okay? Um, completely idiotic. This was a fringe idea, even by the racist standards of the time. And they, th these people, uh, Rudolf von Sebodendorf and Jörg Lanz von Liebenfels, those were the main guys within Ariosophy. Uh, they also established the Ostara magazine, or at least Liebenfels did. That was a racist magazine in Germany. And uh, they promoted some of those ideas in Ostara. And um, yeah, just really, really dumb. Even the Nazis, you know, rejected a lot of it because it was too idiotic. Even though they did retain some of the ideas, which uh, did appeal to Hitler. Uh, but they did talk about the, you know, in their view, the need to outlaw mis uh, miscegenation and to, um, you know, even exterminate other races if it was expedient to do so. Um, now, I did mention that they believed in angels as the ancestors of uh, the Aryan race. And um, these could be interpreted as not extraterrestrials as such but maybe it's better to talk of a fascist cosmology rather than fascist ufology. Ufology is just one current within that broader cosmology. But one thing that they do share in common is that they talk about cosmic forces and imperatives. It's like a, there's a teleological drive and that the Aryan race is trying to fulfill some historic mission. Uh, there's another chapter about um, uh, George Adamski's um, experiences and uh, his friend George Hunt Williamson, who was uh, a member of briefly of the Silver Shirts organization. That was a neo-Nazi group uh, in the United States that was headed by William Dudley Pelly, who established a religious sect called Soulcraft, which espoused the idea that the white race came from space and that other races uh, originated on Earth and that they should stay on Earth. 
So he was a neo-Nazi. He wasn't quite as bad as Hitler, but, you know, he had extremely racist ideas and believed in racial supremacism. And uh, again, you see the UFO connection there. Um, there's also a spiritual connection. So a lot of these religions see the Aryan race as being spiritual, whereas other races are kind of crude and more materialistic, okay? Uh, George Adamski, the famous contactee, he uh, famously supposedly made contact with Orthon, who was a Aryan looking or Nordic looking type alien in the desert in California. And in fact, uh, George Hunt Williamson actually made a cast of the supposed footprint of Orthon and it had a swastika on it. Now, admittedly, the swastika may have derived from Adamski's um, dabblings in theosophy. The, the, you know, theosophy um, did use a swastika, but this was way before the Nazis and the swastika was an ancient um, Eastern mystical symbol. So possibly nothing to do with the Nazis there. But apparently um, Adamski may have been a strong anti-Semite, although I don't know that, that that's a fact, but uh, that's what I've been told by someone or I've heard it from someone rather. Um, but in any case, um, Adamski did uh, you know, promote this idea of these Aryan aliens coming from a society which was not necessarily very democratic. Interestingly, he actually thought that they were communists and this was during you know, the growing Cold War. So he did receive some attention from the FBI apparently, as you do. Um, but uh, George Hunt Williamson was uh, was definitely an anti-Semite. He, um, as I mentioned, was in the silver shirts for a, at least for a short time. He was actually more, much more sympathetic to the uh, Native Americans and he championed their rights, but he really did not like Jewish people. Uh, there's a chapter about um, Savitri Devi and some of her ideas and um, some of her cosmic ideas because she did not believe in UFOs as such. At least she didn't write about them, but she did write about cosmic imperatives. So the idea of the Kali Yuga, which is a Hindu idea, you know, the, the Dark Age, which is going to re be replaced by the Golden Age or the Satya Yuga. She strongly believed that. She thought that Hitler was um, an incarnation of Vishnu, who had come to Earth to kind of clear away the Kali Yuga and usher in the golden age. Now, obviously the, the Axis um, lost the second world war and uh, Nazi Germany was destroyed, but she believed that there was a kind of spiritual battle still going on after the war. And that sooner or later, there would be another uh, incarnation of Vishnu who would come to um, destroy the corrupt Kali Yuga world. Okay. She actually thought that Hitler was not ruthless enough, if you can believe that. So yeah, she didn't really believe in UFOs as such, but she did believe in these cosmic um, narratives. And she also believed that National Socialism was actually the law of the universe. So all of life is engaging in struggle and warfare, according to her. And that's just another way of saying National Socialism. So the the strong have to destroy the weak, and that's just the way it is. So she saw a kind of cosmic significance and imprint of National Socialism on the very fabric of the universe. Uh, there's a chapter about Miguel Serrano, the Chilean diplomat and esoteric Hitlerist. He was a follower of um, Kundalini Yoga and um, esotericism. He believed in um, chakras and stuff like that. He promoted Nazism after the war. I don't know how openly he did that, but he did write books. Um, and he was also a friend of Carl Jung for a while until they had a falling out. He also promoted um, Antarctic UFO myths about the Nazis escaping to Antarctica, maybe even Adolf Hitler escaping to Antarctica. You know, there were stories at that time in newspapers suggesting that maybe um, Hitler had escaped to Argentina on a U-boat. 
This was inspired by actual events in which some German sailors did actually, um, you know, arrive on Argentinian ports. They surrendered, but this inspired some myths about Hitler himself um, surviving and maybe living in Argentina. And then it transmogrified into stories about Antarctica. Okay, Serrano was somewhat instrumental in promoting those myths. Um, but he also, as I mentioned, I think I mentioned, um, yeah, he was a friend of uh, Carl Jung, and he um, really took Jungian ideas to an extreme. So Jung talked about archetypes, these um, shared unconscious beliefs or structures in our psyches. And for Miguel Serrano, these were actually racial spiritual imprints or callings to the universe, like to some cosmic energy, linking the Aryan race to a higher cosmic energy like the black sun. And, you know, he wrote some very abstruse stories and works promoting these kinds of ideas. He had the green ray idea. Uh, he wrote a poem about the green ray. And if you read those sorts of things, you realize that he's promoting this kind of emotional response and it's almost like a druggy feeling you get like even if you don't believe this stuff you can sort of understand why some people might be tempted by it it's very it's really hard to explain actually um it's like that you let go of your rationality and you see beyond the world into a higher reality which he confusingly says does not exist and yet it exists more than anything else so like the black sun does not exist, but, and yet it does exist. Okay, so it's basically trying to break down our rational categories for how we think about the world. And remember, fascism is a very anti-rational ideology. So that makes sense that he would promote that stuff. Um, and I think he also um, promoted um, kind of a warrior cult type of way of thinking um, that that might have been Julius Evola, actually, but um, their ideas also actually overlap to a large extent. But um, yeah, Serrano was very much about esotericism, and he also believed in UFOs, that you could even become a UFO. He believed that Adolf Hitler became a UFO through an act of sheer will, and that you could um, do this by concentrating some sort of mental energy and become a Vimana. He actually wanted to uh, be the ambassador for uh, Chile in India. I don't, th I don't think he ever got to do that, um, but he wanted to be in India to get closer to his Eastern kind of religious and mystical ideas, okay? Interesting thing as well about a lot of these fascists is that they really go in for Eastern mysticism and religious ideas, even though they are supposedly about extolling the virtues of the West, they are taking from the East a lot of their spiritual direction. Oh, and also um, in that chapter, it talks about Rudolf Hess hiding on the moon. So what does that mean? Well, Rudolf Hess was a Nazi official who landed in Scotland uh, to sort of try to broker peace with uh, Great Britain, which Hitler saw Great Britain as a Aryan brother nation, okay? But then he felt betrayed by Great Britain because um, it took Poland's side after Germany attacked Poland. And so Hitler just assumed that uh, Churchill was uh, controlled by Jews or that he was a Jew. So uh, Rudolf Hess was trying to kind of, on his own, apparently on his own accord, uh, I don't know if Hitler was actually the one who sent him to, to try to broker peace with um, England, but... um or Great Britain, but yeah, uh, he was arrested and uh, he died in prison. Uh, he eventually died in prison many years later. Neo-Nazis um, turned him into a martyr and many believe that he had been murdered by the British authorities to try to cover something up. Now, Miguel Serrano believed that Hess the real Hess um, was living on the moon, whereas the 
imposter has is the one who died in prison. Okay, so we see some ideas about the moon also in Nazi, in neo-Nazi mythology. It's the site for flying saucers in some cases. Uh, in this case, it's the um, the site for these, uh, you know, <clears throat> doppelgangers, these uh, Nazi doppelgangers like Hess. Very weird stuff. There's a, let's see, a chapter about <laughs> um, Wilhelm Landig and um, the Flying Sand Growl and the Polar Reich of the Black Sun. Okay, so Landig was a uh, former SS uh, officer who, after the war, he established the Vienna Circle, which was a circle of um, Austrian and German fascists, uh, people who had served on for the... Th you know, in the Third Reich during the war. And they were sort of trying to resuscitate or give hope to that idea, that ideology. And uh, the way Landig did that was to basically uh, write novels about these daring adventures by Nazi expatriates who had fled to Antarctica and then done battles against Soviet and American forces, gone to the Andes, it like established a UFO base in the Andes and um, gone to Shambhala in Tibet and what's the other one? Shambhala and um, not Lemuria, there's another one. It's sort of like the opposite of Shambhala. But anyway, these un underground cities with these secret societies, uh, mystical powers and magic and all that sort of stuff. So these were like complete fantasy novels, but they were expressing a yearning to resuscitate fascism and uh, they were basically Nazi revival myths okay and also they were designed to kind of inspire young people and to get them involved in neo-Nazi movements um, you know I mentioned um, the the bases in the Andes and Antarctica these were very much part of Nazi um, UFO mythology the idea that Nazis fled to Antarctica at the end of the war to establish a secret base there and then to develop the technology and weapons to make a comeback for the, the Fourth Reich. There's a chapter about um, David Miat and his Galactic Reich. So David Miat is a former fascist. He's a British guy. He um, was a neo-Nazi. He's no, no longer a neo-Nazi. He later became pro-Al-Qaeda after the 2001 terrorist attacks. And uh, he would later, you know, renounce violence and extremism, thankfully. But very, very fascinating guy. Extremely intelligent. You know, you read some of his stuff here and it's quoted in this book. You can tell that he's extremely intelligent and imaginative. It's just that he's a little bit wobbly, let's say, when it comes to politics. Anyway, at least he's renounced violence and extremism. But um, this chapter talks about some of those ideas which he had um, in his fascist you know, days. Faustian versus Magian culture. He saw the West as being um, the Faustian civilization, which had initiative and imagination and creativity and a sense of adventure whereas Islamic civilization for example was kind of stagnant and uh, complacent right for for him for Miat um, you could find the symbol of a spaceship in the Viking like a Viking ship because like it's got this sort of aggressive design which is cutting through the water and he saw that as like the symbol that spaceships in the future should adopt like a kind of you know these spaceships which would colonize the universe and destroy everything in their way so he saw like a cosmic imperative for the Aryan race that it had to spread out into the universe and um, exterminate anything that got in its way and become more and more godlike so he wanted the Aryan race to become more like more like God as close as possible to God um, and conquer the entire universe 
He also had some very imaginative ideas about the Nexion. This was like a, let me explain it, um, or try to explain it. It's a very fascinating idea. It's got some overlap with Jacques Vallée's ideas about the relational universe. Um, the, the idea there is basically that we don't live in a temporal universe. We only perceive it to be that way. And that uh, everything in the universe is basically, it's got a relation to everything else. And, you know, like when you notice a coincidence or a synchronicity, um, it's like the universe has got some meaning there. Uh, those two things are related to each other. And that's the real reality. It's not the thing that we see. It's like the the relation behind it is the real reality. And if we could understand that, then maybe the flying saucers would become more intelligible. But, but sort of maybe carrying off from that, I don't know if you read Valet, but the idea is quite similar. So the Nexion is existing in a different realm. And if you could tap into this realm, then you could basically do magic on Earth, right? You could use magic to maybe power the spaceships and you can tap into this Nexion by acts of pure will. So he saw consciousness and emotion as being something that resides in this non-spatial realm. And so if you can tap into the Nexion, you can do things which are seemingly magic and against the laws of physics. So pretty imaginative stuff there. Um, he gave it racial overtones, obviously, saying that, well, he's a little bit sort of fuzzy here. He said that um, you didn't have to necessarily be biologically Aryan, you had to be spiritually Aryan. And that even Jewish people could become spiritual Aryans if they could understand um, these inner truths and how, how to use the Nexion. But anyway, he did later denounce, as I said, uh, fascism. Then he um, was inspired by Al-Qaeda because he saw that as the real Faustian movement and he became a Muslim, but then he later denounced violence and extremism altogether. Then um, there's a chapter about, or well, there's a couple of chapters about Auschwitz and Mengele, you know, Josef Mengele, who was a so-called doctor at Auschwitz. He did horrible experiments on innocent people. Um, it's talking here about the greys, among other things. It's like the greys, famous aliens with big eyes, they are often seen as emotionless, almost robots, right? They abuse, they abuse people, they kidnap and do experiments on people, and they're seen as like these inhuman monsters almost. And who else was like that? Well, the Nazi doctors at Auschwitz, they uh, would kidnap innocent people and then against their consent, they would do horrible experiments on them. And they didn't seem to show any emotion either when they were doing these experiments. Absolutely no regard for the lives of these people, okay, of the victims. And some people even described Auschwitz as being like on another planet because the doctors were not there to cure you, they were there to kill you. And um, so maybe some of this fear and revulsion about these doctors and fascination about them as well, because the post-war period was very much in, you know, at least in some, some, some ways defined by a fascination with Nazism. Um, but some of this may have <clears throat> been infused into alien lore. And especially when you think about the uh, bioinformatics revolution and computers and um, advanced technology. There was a feeling among many in society that we're becoming more robotic and less human and more kind of enslaved by technology, right? And maybe there's a fear there about what we may become in the future, that the, the greys may represent that future destiny if we're not careful. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> you know, monsters like Mangala may have become kind of subconsciously infused into alien lore and then expressed back to us as the gray aliens. It also talks about pedophile lizards from outer space. So the reptilians, right? 
which I guess they became kind of popular after the movie, the miniseries V. I don't know if you've watched that miniseries. It's pretty good. It's about these reptilian aliens who come to Earth to take over, but they're acting very friendly, but they're actually horrible underneath. Um, they want to just exploit humanity and exterminate us. Now, the reptilian theme um, has been taken up very much by David Icke, the British conspiracy theorist. And um, he, he uses a lot of tropes about... He basically takes tropes from anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and then he just replaces Jews with aliens. He's not himself anti-Semitic, but he does basically take the, the same structure of those conspiracy theories and then just reapplies them, but with a different villain. He does talk about um, these reptilians being obsessed with Aryans and that they want to use Aryans for harvesting spiritual energy. And um, you also, he I mentioned the pedophile lizards. Why pedophiles? Well, you know, pedophilia is a, for some reason very much um, a trope in conspiracy lore. Like you hear it with a steel, stop the steel, pizza gate, and all of, all of that stuff. Um, the January sixth uh, insurrectionists often talk about um, pedophile politicians, and a lot of these pe these people also believe that there are these cosmic forces directing politicians or bankers or whoever to abuse children. Um, this is kind of like the Jewish blood libel, I think it's called, where, you know, the protocols of the elders of Zion, this czarist of fabrication, which was designed to sort of stoke up hatred against Jews and to facilitate pogroms. That talked about, um, uh, you know, rabbis drinking blood, the, the blood of Christian children. And that was just meant to kind of stir people up and make people hate Jews. But that um, has become kind of infused into some of these alien conspiracy stories by having the aliens as the pedophiles or as the uh, the directors of the, you know, the the people who kind of direct or the aliens who direct the or encourage the human pedophiles, right, to kidnap and abuse children. There's also a story about um, children being abused and then their suffering opens up another dimension um i forget what that story is called but it's you know completely stupid but um you know it gives you kind of an idea of how anti-semitism can make its way in and then it's expressed in a way where people can say oh that's not really what i meant i'm not anti i'm not anti-semitic ju i'm just against um hillary clinton or something like that but, you know, underneath it, it's really anti-Semitism. Um, and then, let's see, there's a chapter about Antarctic Nazi saucer bases. So this is already touched upon a little bit before with Serrano, but uh, this is more dealing with the myth of Antarctic Nazi saucer bases, per se. And, you know, it's complete rubbish that there were no Nazi bases after World War II in Antarctica. There were no flying saucer bases there. It's like a logistical impossibility, okay? It's not physically possible to do that. But um, it's become a very evocative item in ufology for some reason. Maybe because of how evocative the image is. Because if you think about it, you have these warriors who are leaving their country, they're establishing a new base, and they want to fight for um, the reestablishment of their political system, okay? It's a very evocative image. And maybe for that reason, it's become somewhat popular. But it does also have another theme, which uh, actually Nicholas Goodrick Clark picked up on it, which is that the landscape of Antarctica is a very stark, barren landscape. Um, it's very harsh. You know, you have to live by your wits and you have to be very tough to survive there. 
there are no women in these stories and um, that's probably part of the you know what makes them work is that you don't have any love triangles or anything like that it's just a bunch of guys living in these harsh conditions being you know being forged by them and then that's you know part of like the destiny is to come back and fight for the re-establishment of the Nazi regime the other thing though that um SD Tucker talks about is how it relates to the the Jungian idea or maybe the platonic idea so you have um this landscape which is almost featureless because it's just basically white and nothing else and that's the perfect backdrop against which you can have a platonic idea manifesting especially like if it's under the ice so it's like hidden within this featureless realm so i, I found that very interesting but anyway there has to be some sort of aspect of this myth which you know when i think about it i can't even really articulate it but i, I also find it kind of compelling um, obviously I don't believe it though but I, I can understand why some people might be tempted to fall for it uh, let me just uh, put the cord in running out of batteries there um, let me see so the next one is about uh, the great American airship panic so there was in the US an uh, airship panic at, at you know the close of the 19th century uh, I think it went for on for a couple of years maybe and it was basically a UFO flap before there were flying saucers this had to do with sightings of airships and uh, Brian Santis has talked about this a lot I've interviewed him there's a yeah uh, uh, I forget exactly what the link is there with um racism or fascism but I think one of the people there, um, he kept seeing white people and um, something like that. I think it was to do with seeing Aryans. And uh, this some of these myths might have been resuscitated later on by fascists. There's another chapter about the Gulf War, the 1991 Gulf War, and how some neo-Nazis actually took Iraq's side in that war. They saw Saddam Hussein as a brother who was actually fighting for the rights of Aryans because they saw um, Arabs as, be <clears throat> as being um, basically uh, an offshoot of the Aryan race, okay? Because you had these weird ideas by some neo-Nazis that the Nazis had fled uh, back in time at the end of World War II aboard a UFO. They'd gone back in time to Suma, or Sumeria and established the first civilization there so like a time loop kind of story and then um, you know establishing the Aryan race in effect so they saw um, the Arabs in the Middle East as brothers and Saddam Hussein who was had anti-semitic inclinations and was fighting against the US which the neo-nazis see as being controlled by Jews so they see him as a natural ally and that from Aldebaran they, uh, there would be a fleet coming to earth to help Saddam Hussein defeat the coalition obviously that didn't happen anyway never mind these people still found other ways to profit from these stories or to you know use other tropes to lure people into fascism so like even when the prophecy does not come true they'll just switch to something else uh, and make some excuse so that's that's how it is with cults and some religions like when the prophecy doesn't materialize and then there's um the final chapter is about joseph p farrell who was also an american fascist um he was like copying a lot of other people's ufo stories and trying to really use the ufo mythos to spread fascist ideology in the US okay and then um, the conclusion and the bibliography unfortunately this book does not have an index which is unfortunate but I, I can forgive it because it's such a good book it's a very dense book 
so you're not going to get through it in a day um but i definitely rec <clears throat> recommend that you read this book some other things i didn't cover in my little review there uh hyperborea is mentioned hyperborea is the other uh, i guess that's not i was thinking of like the tibetan underground city there's shambhala and agatha yeah agatha is the other one so there's shambhala agatha and then there's hyperborea which is um was first talked about by the ancient greeks but it's become very much a staple within nazi neo-nazi mythology thule um atlantis the midnight mountain the blue island these are all kind of geographical areas vaguely defined but they they're kind of like um these mystical spots where uh magical things are meant to be happening okay and they they represent like a portals where the aryan race can kind of make a comeback in, in the cosmology of these people um other things well there's a lot of other things really um let's see well i don't i don't know but um <clears throat> yeah just it's a very good book overall um I don't think it talks about Julius Evola very much. Let me just mention Julius Evola though. He's a uh, he was a Italian maybe not a fascist per se, but he was like a traditionalist, he would call himself. He had lots of mystical ideas. He actually inspired some Italian fascist terrorist bombings through his writings. Um and I don't remember if he, he talked about UFOs as such, but he he did have these sorts of similar ideas to people like Serrano. So you'll, you'll hear about Julius Evola a lot as well, if you are familiar with some of the things being said by the alt-right and by these um, so-called traditionalists. Okay. Um, again, you should... I, I mentioned Nicholas Goodrich Clark, Black Sun... This was the book from 2002, or the last edition was. That talked about Aryan cults, esoteric Nazism, politics of identity. Okay, and this current book by Tucker really brings it up to date with a special emphasis on fascist cosmology and esotericism. So definitely check out this book and uh, tell me what you think. Thank you.